Hey there, everyone. Today, I want to look at Frantz Fanon's Black Skin, White Masks. Now, this text is particularly important in race and identity studies because Fanon is going to look at the existential condition of race. So, race had been studied, quote-unquote studied, from afar by various white intellectuals, frankly. But the lived condition of those, specifically under colonization, wasn't really that well documented or understood, and Fanon shows how this brings about some crises for identity that hadn't been considered by Freud or Hegel, and Fanon is a really interesting character. Fanon was born in Martinique, which is an island in the Caribbean, and then he ended up studying medicine in France. He also served in World War I, and then he ended up stationed in Algeria during the Algerian uh, independence situation, and he ended up sympathizing with the FLN, the Front de Libération Nationale, the National Liberation Front, which is the nationalist movement, aiming for Algerian independence from French colonization. And Fanon has some really interesting thoughts here about, particularly in Chapter 4, the so-called dependency complex of the colonized, and Chapter 5, the lived experience of the black man. He lets us know some of the interesting problems that face a colonized individual as they select an identity for themselves. At the end of the introduction, Fanon states white civilization and European culture have imposed an existential deviation on the black man. We shall demonstrate furthermore that what is called the black soul is a construction by white folk. And I do need to preface this. I will be using certain choice language solely because it is in the text, not because I wish to or because I use it in common parlance. Um, I won't be using certain language that is at my behest because I don't feel comfortable with that, but I want to make the listening experience um, as normal as it can be where I'm not just um, censoring every word. Um, but rest assured, this is not something that I take lightly, and I very much understand um, the history of much of this language. So, that being said, one of the most important contributions that Fanon makes in terms of um, kind of understanding the black soul is he's not in favor of the negritude movement. And this was a movement really started by Amy Césaire, in Martinique, and Amy Césaire was a politician and intellectual concerned with kind of finding the black soul, and Fanon thinks that this is a little bit problematic, and he's not saying that the physical aspect of having black skin is a construct by white folk. What he means is that what it means to be black, what that means for how one ought to interact with others, that is what he says is a construction by white folk, and it leads to a lot of the existential problems with finding oneself as a black individual. And you might be like, well, why is this so important? Well, if you think that, I think reading this text is all the more pertinent because you understand the anguish associated with Fanon's very soul concerning what it means to live in this world. And today, I think the question is all the more pertinent, you know, 
What does it mean to be Arab or Jew or Hispanic or African? I mean, you can see that certain of these identities are either really broad or really specific and have along with them certain cultures, certain commonly experienced situations like the Holocaust for the Jews. But then, of course, you know, the notion of Arab, that could be all the way from Morocco to Afghanistan. That's not a very specific marker for experience. So, of course, we get more and more specific. But it's important to understand that these categories exist and that they're used to paint people. For example, when Trump wanted to get rid of all Muslims, which was no doubt more of a xenophobic tactic than it was an anti-Arab tactic. But that said, we can understand why race and ethnicity are so important as categories. And race in particular, because it's a little bit less specific than ethnicity might be. Ethnicity we can kind of link to, you know, in like a sociological manner to cultural practices um, and a shared history. But race can be... I mean, it has some commonalities with skin color, but sometimes it kind of traces tribal lineage lines, whatever it may be. But it's a very unspecific category, and as such, it can be utilized for a lot of different means. Fanal states on page 2, all colonized people, in other words, people in whom an inferiority complex has taken root whose local cultural originality has been committed to the grave, position themselves in relation to the civilizing language, i.e. the metropolitan culture. The more the colonized has assimilated the cultural values of the metropolis, the more he will have escaped the bush, the more he rejects his blackness and the bush, the whiter he will become. And this is a common sentiment expressed in this work, is that black people in Martinique, for example, were always made to feel as if they need to escape from Martinique to France, for example, to the Lycée, to become educated, to become civilized. And when they come back to their homeland, you know, whether this is like the Antilles, which would be like the Caribbean, there's this sort of internalized racism that happens, for example. And Fanon sees hidden within here a subtle little message of Europeans have achieved the ideal, namely whiteness, and dark-skinned folk, whether they're Martinican or Senegalese or, you know, Ghanaian, they have a little bit of ways to travel. They have an ideal they need to achieve. And all the time, this will be laced in certain comments like, oh, you're so smart for a black guy, which, even if they're not intended to be racist, reveal the expectations, the stereotypes, the telos put into the black soul, so to speak, that forces them to travel in certain manners, to act in certain manners. Fanal writes on page 12, When another desperately tries to prove to me that the black man is as intelligent as any white man, my response is that neither did intelligence save anybody, for if equality among men is proclaimed in the name of intelligence and philosophy, it is also true that these concepts have been used to justify the extermination of man. And you might be a little turned off by this quote at first, like, what? Black people aren't as smart as white people? No, that's that that's obviously not even a, a thought for Fanon, because it's so obviously the case that intelligence or savagery is not dictated along racial lines. But this notion that you have to prove that black people are as smart as white people just shows that there's that hidden expectation of savagery or despotism among non-white folk, such that 
the boundaries have already been set up against black people and in the favor of white people, such that that difference can be used as grounds for extermination. You can use all sorts of cultural differences to present this as a difference in intelligence, a difference in rationality. Uh, a good example, for example, and this is a complicated one, but sati, which is um, widow burning. If, a, if an Indian woman from a lower class, if her husband dies, she's supposed to burn herself. That's the practice of sati. And sati was used as an indicative practice that all of India is this backward civilization that needs to be tamed and civilized. And it was one of the crowning reasons for British colonial takeovers in India in the 19th century and in the, you know, into the 20th century. So any difference can be set up as if it is indicative of a lesser intelligence or rationality solely because it is different and as such be used as grounds for extermination. And of particular importance for Fanon is the fact that black people often aren't in control of what it means to live in a, in a society in which one is black. It's often the case that stereotypes and ways of being are imposed from the outside. And sure, you can choose how to respond to them, but the construction of those identities is sometimes not in one's favor. Fanal writes, the fact is that the European has a set of ideas a set idea of the black man, and there is nothing more exacerbating than to hear, how long have you lived in France? You speak such good French. It could be argued that this is due to the fact that a lot of black people speak pidgin, but that would be too easy. You're traveling by train and ask, excuse me, could you please tell me where the restaurant car is? Yes, sonny boy. You go corridor, you go straight, go one car, go two car, go three car, you there. Let's be serious. Speaking pigeon means imprisoning the black man and perpetuating a conflictual situation where the white man infects the black man with extremely toxic foreign bodies. So there's this sense of, you know, the black skin is there, but the mask being crafted for the black skin comes from outside as a sort of toxic body you know, it almost just assails you with the obvious confusion of this whole matter of, well, I didn't even ask for this, but nevertheless, I've been given it, you know, I as a hypothetical, ambiguous black person, not myself, of course. Now, in chapter two, Fanon looks at the woman of color and the white man and anal analyzes in particular Mayat Capesia's I Am a Martinican Woman. And this is basically a personal account of, you know, what it means to be Martinican, what it means to be woman, going through her various life experiences. And there's this idolization of whiteness that we see in I Am a Martinican Woman that's particularly fascinating and you know, tells us a lot about what it means to live in a black body, for example. So at one point, Capacia learns that her grandmother is white. And she writes, I was proud of that. Surely I was not the only one to have white blood, but a white grandmother was less commonplace than a white grandfather. So then my mother was in Matisse. I should have suspected this because of her pale complexion. I found her prettier than ever, more refined, more distinguished. If she had married a white man, would I perhaps have been all white? And would life have been less difficult for me? And she ends this little correspondence. I could only love a white man, a blonde with blue eyes, a Frenchman. And this is so interesting because we see the reason for this attachment in that quote, and would life have been less difficult for me? 
as a result of the person of color having to deal with this profound situation of alienation, of being forced to be in a rather ambiguous way, makes one's life difficult. But of course the thought is, well, if I become white, then now things are easier for me. Which, of course, like, this is true. Life is easier writ large for white people. And as such, it's no wonder that Capecia wants some of that. She wants some of the stability that comes along with having an identity already ready-made that isn't like, you know, up in the air or ambiguous. And there's this fascinating testimony. I mean, fascinating insofar as it is just profoundly confusing and disturbing of a Martinican girl. And she says that she would never marry a black man. And she says, there is a white potential in every one of us. Some want to ignore it or quite simply reverse it. Me, I would never accept to marry an N-word for anything in the world. Anything in the world? There's this profoundly internalized self-racism that Fanon is like, well, how did we get here? And we get a glimpse of this when we see the way media plays into, for example, black identity. Fanon writes on page 34, In full mystical ecstasy, carried away to another world by the hymns, Mayad Capesia imagines herself a pink-cheeked angel. But there is the film Green Pastures, where God and the angels are black, that gave the author a terrible shock. How can God be conceived with Negro features? That's not my idea of paradise. But after all, it's only an American film. And that is Capacia. Fanon continues, How could the good and merciful Lord be black? He's a white man with bright pink cheeks. From black to white, that is the way to go. One is white, so one is rich, so one is handsome, so one is intelligent. And obviously, Fanon is being um, a bit, you know, satirical here, a bit ironic, because we see that there's this media shock that comes from seeing God as black, for example. You know, I think the white Jesus stereotype is so incredibly obvious to the modern viewer that it's like, oh yeah, even I might be a little... um, not taken aback, maybe, but at least confused or shocked when I see Jesus portrayed as black, even though Jesus would have been a darker individual, being from Palestine, of course. But nevertheless, we see that this self-hatred, this self-racism is built into the way one is one sees media, how one sees one's identity reflected in an image around oneself. And Fanon wants us to understand race critically. He wants us to understand it as something hierarchically imposed, something that presents one with an identity to become, but something that we can critically examine, you know, from a psychoanalytic perspective or just a philosophical perspective in general. He writes on page 63, In no way must my color be felt as a stain. From the moment the black man accepts the split imposed by the Europeans, there is no longer any respite. And from that moment on, isn't it understandable that he will try to elevate himself to the white man's level? To elevate himself into the range of colors to which he has attributed a kind of hierarchy? So, right, once you kind of give in to that hierarchy of intelligence or rationality or, you know, you have the select white European races and then you have kind of this trickle-down hierarchy of Senegalese and Martinicans and Ghanaians and, you know, whatever it may be, 
we clearly see that that is imposed. There's a, there's a bit more equanimity there than um, the colonizers would like to think. Now, in chapter 4, the so-called dependency complex of the colonized, Fanon looks at the study of Monsieur Manoni, and Manoni wants to insist that an inferiority complex is not only present in black people, which you know, Fanon is totally willing to grant that, like, yes, there is an imposed inferiority complex of, oh, I need to become more white, right? He's already talked about that. But Manoni wants to insist that the, inferior, the inferiority complex exists prior to colonization, that it's some, some sort of latent potential for being ruled that's just waiting to be actualized. And Fanon doesn't understand how we can do this. Fanon wants to understand this subjective experience of what it is like to be a black person. He wants to understand this as a societally structured and imposed phenomena. He says on page 66, once and for all we affirm that a society is racist or is not. And then he continues, I sincerely believe that a subjective experience can be understood by all. And I dislike having to say that the black problem is my problem and mine alone, and then set out to study it. In this study, I have attempted to touch on the misery of the black man, tactually and affectively. I did not want to be objective. Besides, that would have been dishonest. I found it impossible to be objective. Is there, in fact, any difference between one racism and another? Don't we encounter the same downfall, the same failure of man? So, right, Fanon is kind of taking a humanist perspective here of, well, discrimination is discrimination, and it's the same imposition of identity, whether it's on a Senegalese or a Martinican, and there are societal factors that contribute to a racist structure. For example, he looks at South Africa, and he looks at this statement by Father Oswin McGrath of the Dominican Monastery of St. Nicholas. This is the Republic of South Africa. And he writes, Negrophilism and philanthropy are insults in South Africa. The agenda is to separate the natives from the Europeans territorially, economically, and politically, and to allow them to set up their own civilization under the control and authority of the whites, but, within, but with minimum contact between the races. The aim is to reserve land for the natives and force the majority of them to live on it. Economic competition would be eliminated and the groundwork would be laid for the rehabilitation of the quote-unquote poor whites who make up 50% of the European population. And can we for a moment not only understand the profoundly, I mean just overtly racist structure of apartheid South Africa, but can we understand the parallels to Gaza today? to Palestine today. Separating the natives from the Europeans is analogous to separating Palestinians from Israelis, separating them territorially via walls, economically, you know, via economic opportunity, the ability to find work, and politically, of course, because they have different rights guaranteed. Palestinians are under military law. Israelis are under civilian law. The aim is to reserve land for the natives and force the majority of them to live on it. Has Gaza ever been stated so factually and clearly? So clearly it's obvious that the suffering that people undergo, whether this is Gazans or Martinicans or Algerians or Senegalese or Ghanaians, it is the result of a societal structure which has racist components. And Fana has this very big image for what it means to oppose 
colonial oppression and colonial violence. He writes on page 69, All forms of exploitation are alike. They all seek to justify their existence by citing some biblical decree. All forms of exploitation are identical since they apply the same object, man. By considering the structure of such and such an exploitation from an abstract point of view, we are closing our eyes to the fundamentally important problem of restoring man to his rightful place. Colonial racism is no different from other racisms. I cannot dissociate myself from the fate reserved for my brother. In this case, he is referring to Jews. Every one of my acts commits me as a man. Every instance of my reticence, every instance of my cowardice manifests the man. So, right, there's this view for mankind as a whole. And every time that one stands complicit in the sufferings of others, it just shows the collective capacity, the collective identity of what it means to be mankind. And of course, this can be overwritten by these European stereotypes of, oh, mankind is civilized and kind and delicate and, um, you know, something particularly special. But the fact of the matter is that the imposition of this racism is a collective statement of mankind's failure. As he says, yes, European civilization and its agents of the highest caliber are responsible for colonial racism. And Manoni has this idea that, quote, European civilization and its best representatives are not, for instance, responsible for colonial racism. That is the work of petty officials, small traders, and colonials who have toiled much without great success. So, Manoni seems to think that colonial racism is some sort of fringe byproduct instead of some integral part of the structure of society. But Fanon in this work shows the profound implications of race for the very structure of society. Because one could say, you know, you know, I'm not racist. But nevertheless, are you complicit in a racist structure? Are you supporting a colonial regime, for example, that upholds this structure? I mean, even today, the U.S. upholds these structures of society-wide racism, or at least a societally prevalent racism within Israel, for example, for Palestinians being terrorists in a way that aids the effort of the IDF to do serious damage to 31,000-plus civilians, 10,000 of those being children, Palestinian civilians specifically. And Fanon's point is that society-wide racism doesn't exist without society-wide prejudices being upheld by powerful institutions. They don't spread to the entirety of society without being assisted by, for example, educational institutions. And Fanon quotes Francis Janson, which I think is a really interesting character to help explain what it means to be complicit. He writes, day after day, the system weaves around you its pernicious consequences. You pride yourself on keeping your distance from a certain order of things. As a consequence, you give a free hand to those who thrive in unhealthy atmospheres, a creation of their own behavior. And if, apparently, you manage not to soil your hands, it's because others are doing the dirty work in your place. You have your henchmen, and all things considered, you are the real guilty party. For without you, without your blind indifference, such men could not undertake acts that condemn you as much as they dishonor them. And you know, one might read this and be like, man, this is so extreme. I don't have any part in upholding racism. 
tell that to the average German citizen in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. The implicit acceptance of anti-Semitism provided the grounds for the Nazis. The Nazis didn't create anti-Semitism. It already existed. And the fact that it was able to fester for so long and the fact that it was able to gain adherence as a sort of prevailing societal ideology provided the groundwork for the Holocaust, for the regime of the Nazis. So you might think that, oh, I'm not really doing anything harmful, materially speaking. Even if you're supporting something, you know, racist, Racism doesn't have to be material to be profoundly implicated in the societal structure and in the possible future events. And I like what Fanon says here about the Malagasy. And the Malagasy are a tribe native to Madagascar. And he writes on page 78, It is in fact obvious that the Malagasy can, perform, can perfectly bear not being a white man. A Malagasy is a Malagasy. Or rather, he is not a Malagasy, but he lives his Malagasy hood. If he is a Malagasy, it is because of the white man. And if, at a certain point in his history, he has been made to ask the question whether he is a man, it's because his reality as a man has been challenged. In other words, I start suffering from not being a white man insofar as the white man discriminates against me, turns me into a colonized subject, robs me of any value or originality, tells me I am a parasite in the world, that I should toe the line in the white world as quickly as possible, and that we are brute beasts, that we are a walking manure, a hideous forerunner of tender cane and silky cotton that I have no place in the world. So we see that for many people of color, their identity only comes into existence as this rationally defined Malagasy or this rationally defined black man, for example, as a result of an imposed other category that imposes upon them violence and control and oppression that makes them feel that they need to extrapolate some sort of identity. Instead of just living one's Malagasyhood, in other words, just living one's life as someone who happens to be in black skin, it isn't until the white identity becomes imposed upon the black man that they feel it necessary to become the black man, in the sense of the category that defines what it means to be a black man, societally in terms of the stereotypes that go along with it. Not what it means existentially, or rather materially in terms of living in that skin, you know, the, the melanin content of your skin. That's obviously not a societal social construct, and that's not what Fanon is saying. But what he's saying, and this is very profound, and it's something we see a lot in anthropology, for example, and political science, too, is when we look at nationalism, it typically comes about as a result of outside conflict. And this outside conflict causes nations to need to make a national identity in order to have a foundation for political sovereignty, for example, and political organization. Now, Fanon mentions how he would, you know, psychoanalyze a dream, for example, but he states that when he's away from his consulting room and he's trying to integrate these findings into the world, he concludes that, you know, a patient is suffering from an inferiority complex and he needs to find ways to safeguard himself, but also liberate himself from these unconsciously imposed desires. But second, he states, 
If he is overcome to such a degree by a desire to be white, it's because he lives in a society that makes his inferiority complex possible, in a society that draws its strength by maintaining this complex, in a society that proclaims the superiority of one race over another. It is to the extent that society creates difficulties for him that he finds himself positioned in a neurotic situation. Right, so this this problematization of one's identity, vis race, only comes about through the imposition of, you know, profoundly difficult existential circum circumstances on the person of color. Now, chapter five, the lived experience of the black man, is perhaps the most moving chapter of this work. It takes on a profoundly different character from the other chapters. It is less clinical. It's far more literary and prosaic. Fanal writes on page 91, beneath the body schema, I had created a historical racial schema. The data I used were provided not by remnants of feelings and notions of the tactile, vestibular, kinesthetic, or visual nature, but by the other, the white man, who had woven me out of a thousand details, anecdotes, and stories. I thought I was being asked to a construct to construct a physiological self, to balance space and localize sensations, when all the time they were clamoring for more. So right, the black identity in colonized scenarios is often not the remnant of any feeling or experience that a black person has actually had because these stereotypes are invented by the white man who has these preconceptions that go into his understanding of the black man, which then gets grafted onto the black man and decides how is it that he ought to live in the world. So there is no vestibular remnants. There is no tactile remnants of, oh, I was once a savage. No, it's the white man is telling me, the black person, I, I'm not a black person, but you get the idea, that I am a savage. And one of the most famous parts of this text is this little interaction that Fanon has with a white girl with a young white girl. And she keeps saying, look, a Negro. And at first it's a passing sting. Then he's beginning to enjoy himself. Then he's really starting to enjoy himself. He's getting this reinforcement of, you know, oh, this is what I am. This is what I am. But then the girl says, Maman, look, a Negro, I'm scared. Fanal responds, scared? Scared? Now they were beginning to be scared of me. I wanted to kill myself laughing, but laughter had become out of the question. Right? It's just laughable, the idea of, what, you're scared of me and you don't even know me? You're just looking at my skin color? But there's something profoundly upsetting about it, too. And there's a sort of objectness about what it means to be black that Fanon calls one's blackness. He says that I cast an objective gaze over myself in discovering my blackness. He says that he gave himself up as an object, that there's a thematization of identity that was not my idea. Right, So what it means to be black presents itself as if it was referring not to any real person, but to an object created and crafted and selectively distributed by the white individual. Fanon states, My body was returned to me spread-eagled, disjointed red bone, draped in mourning on this white winter's day.
The Negro is an animal. The Negro is bad. The Negro is wicked. The Negro is ugly. Look, a Negro. The Negro is trembling. The Negro is trembling because he's cold. The small boy is trembling because he's afraid of the Negro. The Negro is trembling with cold, the cold that chills the bones. The lovely little boy is trembling because he thinks the Negro is trembling with rage. The little white boy runs to his mother's arms. Maman, the Negro is going to eat me. I mean, eat me? Like, we see in this quote, precisely because of the way that this identity is developed, and I hope you'll excuse the excessive problematic language in here, that there's this sort of back and forth of ambiguity of each party doesn't know what each other means. By this identity that they say as some prefigured category of, you know, the, the black person is bad, wicked, ugly, savage, whatever it may be. This can be volleyed back and forth, but there's always this kind of lag, this sort of error in translation of, well, what do you mean? Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? And before you know it, you turn into uh, Ibon Banania, which is a caricature that Fanon mentions rather regularly which is, it's like a media figure that's a caricature of a Senegalese troupe. And it just has this air of the kind of trope of the stupid African. And it's like, before you know it, Fanon's talking about, you just, one day you just appear as this fixed identity. He says, I arrive slowly in the world. Sudden emergences are no longer my habit. I crawl along. The white gaze, the only valid one, is already dissecting me. I am fixed. Once their microtomes are sharpened, the whites objectively cut, cut sections of my reality. I have been betrayed. I sense, I see in this white gaze, that it's the arrival, not of a new man, but of a new type of man, a new species. A Negro, in fact. To so, write a fixed identity based on stereotypes exists that is slidden into. It has nothing to do with an existential fact of, oh, I've met you, I know you, I know what you're like, I know your personality, and thus I've derived this from a real encounter. No. It's this, it's com almost like the, when Deleuze and Guattari talk about you don't so much have a face as you slide into one, right? There's stuff already there. There's precedent in societal structures, in a sort of overdetermined identity that one slowly slides into. And the profoundly obvious way to understand how the black identity has been crafted from the outside of, oh, you ought to act like this, it's inevitable that you will act like this, is in science. Fanon says here on page 99, scientists reluctantly admitted that the Negro was a human being. In vivo and in vitro, the Negro was identical to the white man. Same morphology, same history. So, right, there's... There is this reluctance, which we can see this reluctance in this next section, where Fanon says everyone was in agreement with the notion that Negro is a human being, i.e. his heart's on the left side, added those who were not too convinced. But on certain questions, the white men remained uncompromising. Under no condition did he want any intimacy between the races, for we know, quote, crossings between widely different races can lower the physical and mental level. Until we have a more definite knowledge of the effect of race crossings, we shall certainly do best to avoid crossings between widely different races. And that's John Alfred Mjoen from Harmonic and Disharmonic Race Crossings. And <sighs> 
you know, obviously to the modern viewer, can lower the physical and mental level. Level of what? Physical and mental level of what? You haven't actually given a referent in that sentence. But we can understand that by giving a scientific backing to race, we impose what it means to exist, not just materially, but socially, for that race. Fanon says, they inscribed on my chromosomes certain genes of various thickness representing cannibalism. Next to the sex linked, they discovered the racial linked. Science should be ashamed of itself. Indeed, Fanon, indeed it should. And you know, when you're at Thanksgiving dinner and a family member says something racist, you might just throw it off. Oh, it's just benign. It doesn't really mean anything. But in fact, racism says something very societally integral about a sort of narcissistic undertone. Fanal writes on page 107, the white man wants the world. He wants it for himself. He discovers he is the predestined master of the world. He enslaves it. His relationship with the world is one of appropriation. But there are values that can be served only with my sauce. As a magician, I stole from the white man a certain world, lost to him and his kind. When that happened, the white man must have felt an aftershock he was unable to identify, being unused to such reactions. So we see in there a hint of, you know, you can assimilate a different culture, but you don't really know what it's like to be that other culture. You don't know what it's like to be of another world, quote unquote. And that is an aftershock of identity that is unique to the one whose identity is being imposed. And Fanal writes, as a friend who taught in the United States told me, the blacks represent a kind of insurance for humanity in the eyes of the whites. When the whites feel they have become too mechanized, they turn to the coloreds and request a little human sustenance. At last, I had been recognized. I was no longer a non-entity. And this is something we still see today, and, you know, it would help if you had some of the context that I haven't included here, but there's this sort of romanticized caricature of black people that gets supported by various white people of, oh, they're in touch with the ancestors. They have this primal relationship of being closer to the earth. They are more, I mean, think about rephrasing that. It's like saying you are more base, base as in closer to the base, the ground of reality. And this might sound real pretty of, You know, this is the insurance policy of black people serve as some sort of mysterious sustenance. We can see this in the stereotype of like the wise Indian guru, for example, or I don't know, the wise Japanese man who delivers to you some sort of profound statement about the military or virtue or courage or whatever. It may sound like an identity is being given, like one is being returned as an entity. But in fact, it's almost as if you're being patronized and you're being told that you're primitive or subhuman, but in a nicer way. And Fanal's like, look, I am not a primitive. I'm not a subhuman. He says, I belong to a race that had already been working silver and gold 2,000 years ago. He mentions how, um, you know, people of his race have been able to erect houses, administer empires. Their religion has its own beauty of, you know, being close to the city's founder, built on solidarity, goodwill, respect. And Fanat just has this really empowering image of identity, which, I mean, man, it just, there's something about this work that really speaks to you, even if you're not one of these oppressed groups. He says, I put the white man in his place. 
Emboldened, I jostled him and hurled in his face. Accommodate me as I am. I'm not accommodating anyone. He writes on page 114 that black consciousness is imminent in itself. I am not a potentiality of something. I am fully what I am. I do not have to look for the universal. There is no room for probability inside me. My black consciousness does not claim to be a loss. It is. It merges with itself. He says, The black experience is ambiguous, for there is not one Negro. There are many black men. Black men, sorry. And we can see here that not only has Fanon talked about this sort of unity through struggle, he says, we regroup our forces sundered by the deceits of our masters as the contradiction of the features creates the harmony of the face. We proclaim the unity of suffering and revolt of all the peoples over the face of the earth. And we mix the mortar of the age of brotherhood in the dust of idols. Not only is this their uh, unity through struggle, but it's not about, oh, you're more likely to be a cannibal because of your DNA, or, oh, you're more likely to be stupid because of your skin color. No. Fanon wants to get to the lived experience of what it's like to be a colonized individual, what it's like to be a colored individual, and to realize that there is an identity imminent to itself that doesn't need to be imposed, and that that needs to be respected if we want to understand what it means to be in a black body, for example. Fanon finishes... The black man is a toy in the hands of the white man. So in order to break the vicious circle, he explodes. I can't go to the movies without encountering myself. I wait for myself. Just before the film starts, I wait for myself. So right, waiting for himself in the sense of waiting for some caricature, some brute, just disgusting image of himself. He continues, The crippling soldier from the Pacific War tells my brother, get used to your color the way I got used to my stem. We are both casualties. Yet with all my being, I refuse to accept this amputation. I feel my soul as vast as the world, truly a soul as deep as the deepest of rivers. My chest has the power to expand to infinity, I was made to give, and they prescribed for me the humility of the cripple. When I opened my eyes yesterday, I saw the sky in total revulsion. I tried to get up, but the eviscerated silence surged toward me with paralyzed wings. Not responsible for my acts, at the crossroads between nothingness and infinity, I began to weep. And man... What profound prose. I mean, what, a, what an awesome writer Fanon is. But we see here that the black individual always is struggling with this imposition of a sort of, a sort of amputated identity that has to be dealt with and that situates them in a profoundly difficult spot. So I hope this has been helpful in understanding this text. Check out any of my other lectures that I've done on postmodernism, gender studies, critical theory. Become a channel member for $5 a month and gain access to, among other things, a private philosophy Zoom that you can tailor to your needs. That's it for this lecture, and I'll see you in another one.